Pariyati Audiobooks presents Cultivating Inner Peace by Dr. Paul R. Fleischman, as read by the author. Chapter 6 Selectivity and the American Family An important fraction of the pain that brings people to psychotherapy comes from a widespread loss of knowledge about how to live selectively and simply. Many apparently sophisticated American adults don't know how to generate inner calm or interpersonal goodwill. Our contemporary society has amplified the amount of stimuli and the pace at which we are exposed to them on a routine basis. While each individual unit of input may be informative or pleasant, the sum aggregate produces an experience of flailing to keep up, overload. This intensity derives both from obligations like work and also from pleasures so that year by year we greet our colleagues, patients, family, or friends only to hear a chorus of voices exclaim how busy, behind, overcommitted they've been. Phone messages pile up. Friendships are maintained by car and plane. Unwanted mail spills out of the letterbox. There's more paperwork at work, more places to drive the kids, more worthwhile concerts and movies that have been recommended by friends whose advice is worth listening to. If you unplug yourself for a vacation, you're punished on return by large cartons of printed matter waiting like lions and by blinking red lights that make your telephone answering machine look like a movie marquee. Every time I'm driving along a back road enjoying a September full moon, somebody drives up behind me, flicks their high beams in my rearview mirror, and honks. Inner peace isn't just a thought. It's also a neurological tone. We can hear it humming when we learn to diminish distraction. Restlessness, inability to be alone, ill ease with solitude, are the products of a pervasive cultural milieu in which human bodies are appendages to electronic toys, driven achievements, and consumer passion. Our children have lost permission to dwell in the spacious reverie of newness. They no longer inhabit the structureless domes of uninterrupted afternoons. In order for us to function efficiently, we need them to be busy. We also, out of well-intended concern, want to prepare them to deal competently with our gadget-dense sphere so that, almost from the start, children are propelled into a high rhythmic froth. This could be a sprightly animation if it were balanced by an equal but opposite emphasis on inward serenity and outward harmony, which would provide an orchestrating principle, a focus to the swirl not precluding skillful assertion, but orienting it. The receptive neurology of a child can catch and hold real experiences in contemplative stillness and inner joy. I would recommend, beyond any teaching at all, our sons and daughters be granted the open space and time to watch dust motes filter across shafts of light, to visit beaches in windy weather and listen to waves cleave doorways into infinity through their hypnotic, repetitive roar, to imprint in his or her heart a few mantram lines of poetry, to watch the seasons dress and undress outside his or her window, 
to lie in his or her room at night and hear the rustle of eternity and death that shadows make on the ceilings of children's rooms. To feel, to think, and to understand requires free time, privacy, quiet, and solitude, even or most essentially in a child. Have you heard contemporary educators analogize the mind to a computer? I think a peaceful mind is more like moonlight, wind, and invisible wings, full of beautiful lights, formlessness, and suggestions. Many children today are encouraged to live in desperate, ceaseless striving. The divorce and depression endemic in our society spring not only from neurotic quirks within the individual's personal past, but from the matrix of a culture that doesn't value, teach, or create people who know how to listen, receive, appreciate. We raise children who are rarely reflective and contained, who often domineer, press buttons, keep score. Yet peace and harmony are real-life skills. We anxiously, lovingly peer into the future, wondering whether our son will be able to maintain a marriage without competing and imposing. If we could only encourage and admire his success, how will he have learned to love and be able to love? With such monotonic stress on mastery and appropriation, will our daughter even have heard of deference, reverence, and awe? How will she face death and find meaning in the totality of her life that she cannot conquer. Can she really feel or only function? As a psychiatrist, I see what happens to these children grown up. They experience life as if an entire section of the spectrum of human emotion were deleted, as if they felt red and yellow, but never blue or green. Selectivity is an experience of focal effort, energetic quest, self-knowledge regarding mental states of poise, and fullness in the presence of a limit. Selectivity, optimally learned in childhood, is knowledge about how to reduce inner tension by choosing foci and by learning competence and satisfaction. Satisfaction doesn't mean a biological state of satiety, but a learned psychological capacity. Children who have been taught to crave the newest Nintendo game and who argue over whose parent has the most luxurious car are being educated in dissatisfaction. A child learning to tune in to her grandmother's life story or to a picture book in whose illustrations tree roots blend into angels and magpies, or to the careful method of catching salamanders after spring rains, is learning focus, skill, attention, and playful kinship with the world. The child learning selectivity as a way of life is not restrained or withheld, for obedience is the opposite of self-control. But she exudes a feeling of eager expectation. The capacities to choose and sustain objectives of attention, to gate out the irrelevant, and to appreciate what one has are aspects of self-regulation that enable both action and satisfaction. Satisfaction means to feel you've done enough. A child is climbing her first mountain. With an alternation of enthusiasm and flagging spirits which require exhortation from her adult guides, 
She sweats and strains her legs until the thigh muscles shake like jelly. At rest stops, she observes or is shown black-throated blue warblers migrating and singing among the black birch branches or patches of painted trillium flowers sequestered behind nice boulders. As she approaches the summit, the child runs on magically rejuvenated legs and excitedly calls the others to come and see. She points to the expanding panorama of the world. This child will be friends with striving, sweat, and pure water. She will eagerly guide others someday, sons or daughters of her own. In the future, she will seek heights and bulldog her way out of sloughs and dare to ignore the catcalls of the gang on the corner because selectivity is a memory of the joy of the mountaintop. She knows how to choose a trail and climb to an unforgettable vista. I'm not praising a mere military hike that stalks obliviously past the vireos, violets, and visual haikus, the kind of marching that drills in conquest, nor a coaxing and begrudging upward shuffle reinforced with candy bars and the promise of terminal ice cream. Selectivity is the capacity to experience intrinsic pleasure with personal action. It breeds a trim mind that will always ascend towards the open horizon because that is where clarity and receptivity reach their maximum expanse. On mountaintops of any altitude, I have witnessed a child receiving the echo of his own harmony, coming back to him from the vibration of the universe. Ironically, scatter and dissatisfaction retain positive valuation in American life because they're assumed to be catalytic precursors to the competitive urge. When children who have been trained in dissatisfaction grow up, they may become successful, but peaceful states of mind elude them because their accomplishments simply trigger new internal demands. Their success emerges at the cost of an unshakable irritability that is the winter imprint of a culture of acquisition and aggression in which every human intimacy is bought and sold as a commodity. They have learned to amplify the feeling of need which drives their striving for success rather than having learned the art of appreciation towards near and dear people and the proximal props that share our stage. These people have never learned how to select the channel of satisfaction. They have been trained to deny the fact that peace and happiness are also forms of curtailment. In order for children to grow up with a helpful knowledge of selectivity, Precursors are best set in place in childhood, the focalization of attention and the moderation of acquisition. This will facilitate the adult love of spouse, child, friend, nearby trees, and the heavens seen through a kitchen window. I often wonder how much of our epidemic of children and adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, allegedly a genetic disease, but mysteriously sensitive to changes in culture and as rare in England as it is proliferating in America is induced by our sizzling and impersonal home environments. Our children can no longer hear the subtleties of the lead guitar because they've turned up the bass response to drums and guns. Conversely, there may be societies that selectively attune their children to the simple joys of life. Camping in Alaska with his Native American guides, John Muir sat up at night and had a long talk with the Indians about the stars. Their eager attention was refreshing, 
as compared with the decent, death-like apathy of weary civilized people in whom natural curiosity has been quenched in toil and care and poor, shallow comfort. The selectivity that leads to peace as a life pattern is a product of example and education, the transmission of cultural wisdom. If an individual has never witnessed or experienced a sense of choice and self-responsibility, he or she will create shallow and externalized life goals. Those who grow up tasting psychological calm will seek it like bees after pollen. Let us open the door and observe a family where selectivity is one operative value. Their house or apartment is smaller than it might well have been because the parents have pursued their careers with energy, determination, and limits. And they're the kind of people who also treasure family life. As we observe them over time, we are struck by the pool of benignity that their shared activities create. Of course, these meetings constitute a limited proportion of their daily and weekly life, which is strung out among jobs and schools, and which even at home is often merely fast and functional. But we do see them decide not to go to Boston on the weekend, and instead to listen to the audio tape of the Count of Monte Cristo together with its dose of alerting mystery and tension. They absorb the warmth that derives from shared silent listening to a great mood conductor. At another junction, we catch them sitting around the wood stove, reading aloud from a book that passes around the circle among them, maybe Tolkien or Le Guin. Not that they're always nested. During the February school vacation, they are cross-country skiing on abandoned logging roads among the massive skeletons of wintry yellow birch and traversing frozen beaver ponds. In June, they sit on their deck for a full hour or two, doing nothing, no book, no talk, and listen to the copious multiphonic concert of robins and thrushes and orioles and sparrows whose songs have an emotional meaning that any human listener can respond to with empathic recognition. When friends visit this family, the cooking is apt to be shared. The toddlers are recognized and appreciated. Problems surface and are listened to. Wry political critique from Doonesbury or Dave Barry, lyses the tensions of the world. We are observing a family that, when possible, within the static of life, selects for harmony, mutuality, focused attention, soothing scenarios, literature, nature, friendship, and play. Their selections are recurrently interpersonal, meaningful, and compelling, and are drawn from the simple great gifts. Single people and childless couples have an expanded opportunity for choice and focus. At an earlier era of history when childbearing was uncontained and labor oppressively unregulated, celibates and monastics were the only people who could control their choices for serenity. But family-less people also have fewer stabilizing buffers against dissipation and rigidification, for family life intrinsically imposes the order of nurturant routine and the captivating transformations of growth. At its best, Parenting means creating a psychological eggshell for safety in which the young gradually peck holes and shatter. For parents, eggshells are nature's best reminder that growth can only follow selective containment.